Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Texas Science Festival session on machine perception and intelligent robots with Peter Stone and Kristen Grumman. We are so glad that you could join us for this. It's going to be an incredible presentation. Um, my name is Rebecca McEnroy. I'm with KUT Radio. I'm a producer and host with KUT. And I would like to thank some people who are on the back end making all of this happen. Mariel, Monica, Christine, and Aaron. Thank you, guys. Also, please note that all participants will be muted and without video for the duration of the webinar. And because this is one of our Science Sparks event, each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes, and then we'll move on to a Q&A. So just put your questions in the chat and um, and I'll get them and then I will ask the presenters the questions toward the end. Um, I would also like to introduce, uh, or I would also like to introduce, actually I would like to introduce for the first time our first speaker, Professor Dr. Peter Stone. He is the founder and director of the Learning Agents Research Group within the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin, as well as Associate Department Chair and Director of Texas Robotics. Hello, Peter. I will let you take it away. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Rebecca, and thanks for the, for the organizers and for everybody who's here. Um, so uh, the talk, uh, the presentation today is in two parts. It's machine perception and intelligent robots. So I'm gonna be uh, representing the intelligent robots part. And then Kristen coming after me will be talking about machine perception. Um, but just to, to jump in, um, I just, you know, I can't help but, but sharing the, the exciting times um, here at UT Austin. And there's a bunch of different things that I'm a part of. I don't have time to go into detail, but you can find lots of information on the web. We've launched a new machine learning laboratory. We have a, a cross-disciplinary program on sort of AI for good called Good Systems that involves people from the humanities, social science, people like me in computer science, um, public policy, all coming together, thinking about these things. And I am, as Rebecca said, director of Texas Robotics. We've got a new, new space. We have um, a whole bunch of fantastic faculty here. One of the really um, largest and, and, uh, and I'd say you know, best robotics groups in, in the world these days. But what I'm going to talk about today is um, intelligent robots and really in the context of one of the this being one of the big scientific questions of our time I'd say there's sort of um, there's three people may come up with with different ones but I say there's there's sort of you know three big scientific questions of our time one is how did the universe originate um, another is how did life on earth originate and another is what's the nature of intelligence and um, and it's this last one that really drives me, that, that's really the focus of, of, um, of my research. And there's a number of ways to get at this question of the nature of intelligence. How can we, how can we study it? We could, we could just think about it. You know, what does it mean to be intelligent? What, what makes me intelligent, but the, you know, the thermostat in my house not intelligent or, or the door not intelligent? And you know, sort of, um, that's what philosophers do. We could also study it by, by looking at, at human or other animal behavior, um, which is what psychologists do. We could study the human or other animal brains, which is what neuroscientists do. Or we could try to build and analyze intelligent artifacts. And that's what computer scientists like myself and, and Kristen, that's what we do. And, and, so, um, and so that's, that's sort of, you know, um, one of that, that's, I feel very fortunate to be sort of studying this um, this question, which I really think is one of the, the big scientific um, challenges of our, of our day. So that leads to my, the, my research problem, the, the, the question that I've been trying to, to answer throughout my scientific career over more than a, a quarter century now. I, I started working in AI um, before it was cool. Now, now it is sort of a cool thing to be working on, but um, to, uh, and, you know, the question that I've always been looking at and which I think is gonna sustain my, my research career because I don't think we're close to answering it. It's to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and or, or adversaries in real time dynamic domains. And so there's a number of areas, sub areas of artificial intelligence that this, this gets at, but maybe the best way for me to communicate to you the kinds of questions that, um, that I study, I'll show you some of, the, some of the challenge problems that we try to address in my, in my research as motivating some of the basic scientific questions. So um, one that I've been involved in for years is, is robot soccer. And so um, you know, the challenge of trying to get robots to be able to um, to play 
uh, to play soccer. That's, that's actually a clip from um, 15 years ago. And then more recently, we've been working with these humanoid robots. These are robots made by, um, by SoftBank. The previous ones were the Sony IBOs. Um, this is a clip from a, from a competition we participated in um, uh, several years ago. Our robots are the ones with the hands behind their backs. They, um, they do that so they don't get you know, bump into and get caught on the other robots. But they're doing this um, by themselves, fully autonomously. They have to perceive the ball. They have to figure out how to work as a team. They have to actually execute the actions. Here you see our robot going in on a breakaway um, against a, the in the finals of a, a, um, a game against a team from a different university, the University of Bremen. Um, we ended up winning this, this competition. And then when we came back to UT, they lit the tower orange for us, which was a, a great honor. Um, that's sort of one of the challenge problems. Another that I've been working on a lot is, is trying to get um, autonomous robots to become a part of, of the social fabric of our, of our buildings. This is, a, this is a robot as a part of what we call the Building Wide Intelligence Project, where, and the, the video itself is actually joint research with a colleague of mine, Ray Mooney, where we were trying to get the robots to learn from experience how to um, interpret the, the um, kinds of sentences or kinds of words people would say to a robot when they're trying to get it to do something. So, um, you know, at first, at the beginning of this week-long experiment, um, if a person typed to, the, to a robot, take coffee to Peter's office, the robot might not have understood it. It would have to ask the question, where's Peter's office? And then the person might type back, oh, that's office 3.508. Well, then the robot would learn that my office is 3.508. And this is a way people tend to, um, to request uh, deliveries to, to, to me. What, you know, so it's a, it was a grounded language learning problem. Um, but the overall challenge here is just, you know, to have the robot become a part of, um, be a part of the social fabric of the building, as I said, which means being able to recognize when people want to be, um, interrupted, when they want to be helped, when they want to be entertained, when they want to be left alone, being able to navigate past people. And there's a whole bunch of, of research challenges that this inspires for us. Um, another problem I've worked on over many years is autonomous driving. You've all seen, you know, and heard and thought about the notion of autonomous cars. We had a car in the DARPA Urban Challenge back in 2007. This is a picture of our car. Um, we don't have that anymore because all the car companies are sort of investing a lot in, in building autonomous um, cars. But we do think a lot about what will the world look like when all the cars on the road are autonomous. And, and this is an example of multi-agent systems. This is what I think traffic uh, intersections could look like when we, you know, when we have autonomous cars. We won't need traffic signals and, and stop signs anymore, but we'll be able to have the cars communicating with one another to reserve space to go through the intersection. The, the, in this video, the cars that are white have reserved space and the ones that are, are yellow don't yet have a reservation they have to stop but then once they turn white they have a, a guaranteed path through the intersection that won't collide with the other cars so these are some of the the challenge problems just to, you know i don't have a lot of time to go into detail but just to tell you you know once uh, one or two slides about the um, some of these challenges um, i'm actually right now the president of the international robot soccer federation called robocop and we have a a somewhat ambitious goal, which is by the year 2050 to create a team of humanoid robots that can beat the best World Cup champions on a real soccer field. And, um, you know, this is a challenge. If we can do it, it it's would you know bring together many of the concepts of artificial intelligence and help us get at the notion of, you know, what is the nature of intelligence? Um, it's uh, um, still in its relatively early stages. There's still several years to go if we're going to meet that goal of 2050. Um, but we've been working on it as a worldwide community for several years and you know, starting from about uh, almost 25 years ago now. Um, if we look back to some of the first attempts, um, it's sort of painful for me to watch now because the robots are very you know, incompetent. They fall over, they run into walls. Some of them actually caught fire that year. Um, but they did score some goals. They were able to you know, operate in the real world. And this was a big, big research achievement back then. If you jump forward several years, you start to see, um, and this is still you know, 15 years ago now, that, that the robots are, became much more individually capable. They started to exhibit teamwork and passing. Um, and again, you have to remember, these aren't all my robots. These are robots from a community of researchers around the world, all trying to use robot soccer as a test bed for um, studying the nature of, in, of intelligence. And, um, and there's you know, just been, been dramatic progress um, over the years and continued if you watch some of the, the more recent videos. And we even do have now practice games of 
um, people against the robots. So uh, where we take the champion from the, the what we call the middle sized league, the ones with these sort of you know, trash can sized robots and a real soccer ball. And every every year we see if, if uh, aging amateur soccer players such as myself are able to, to still beat the robots. And um, so far we're able to, here's me scoring a goal. They, uh, they ended up not counting it. They called me for offsides, but, but nonetheless, we're able to, to see that, that um, you know, every year we do this and every year it gets a, gets a little bit harder. And you now that's partly, I hope, because the robots are getting better. It's probably a little bit because we're getting older, but, um, but it's a, you know, this ongoing challenge. We're still a far long way from the robots being able to beat people, um, but it's a, it's a great source of insp uh, inspiration. More related to the Building Wide Intelligence Program, um, there's also um, what we call RoboCup at Home, which is trying to put service robots like this one, this is a Toyota HSR robot, um, trying to do tasks like taking out the trash and putting away groceries and, and things like that, where the robot has to um, manipulate objects. And so now it's not just you know, moving around and, and kicking, but it has, has to pick things up. It has to navigate through an environment. There's, there's tasks where it has to interact with people in natural language. These are the kinds of things that we're trying to get robots to do. We know people can do them and trying to figure out, you know, can we, um, can we get, how can we program robots to be able to do these things um, as well? And in fact, we actually, you know, one of the tasks in RoboCup at Home is having a robot go into a restaurant that it's never been in before, um, present a bunch of, of objects on the table, like, like you see here, and then a person waving over the robot and having a, uh, the robot has to go over to the person, um, take an order, like bring me the Pringles, the robot has to go collect the right object and bring it back to the person. Um, just to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you just one um, sort of vignette on some of the, the, uh, the research kinds of things we do in, in uh, the research community um, that's motivated by these problems. There's robot walking is, is a challenge. If you're gonna try to get a, a robot to play soccer, the person has to be able to, to walk. And that's something you'd like to be able to get the robot to learn how to do. Um, and in particular, this is the walk on that Aldebaran robot that, that some colleagues of ours at a university in Australia programmed by hand. Um, it was the fastest walk at the time. And we said, well, could we use um, simulation to have the robot learn and practice with lots and lots of data in simulation and get that to work in the real, ro real world? Um, this is a big challenge because the simulation is never exactly the same as the real world. And nonetheless, we were able to learn the fastest known walk on this, on this robot um, ultimately going 28, uh, 28 centimeters per second using a type of machine learning to have it figure out how should it move its joints, um, you know, do the kinds of things that, that we would, this is sort of very, very low level type of intelligence, but to be able, the ability to move in the world robustly is a form of intelligence. So in the, I know I need to wrap up and, and take some questions. In the interest of time, I'll just tell you, I do a bunch of research in reinforcement learning on a bunch of different uh, topics. Reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning that we study in, in, um, in artificial intelligence. And I also do some work in, in multi-agent systems. And one of the big challenges we've, I've been looking at is, um, again, motivated by this soccer problem, is, is how, do we, how would we create a good team player, an agent that, that's able to like play a pickup game of soccer or or collaborate with other robots in a disaster rescue scenario after an earthquake, where the robots work programmed to work together, but they have to figure out on the fly how to work together as a team. People can do this. We're trying to figure out how can we get robots to do this. So, you know, that's a that's a very quick whirlwind through the the you know tour through the kinds of problems that that motivate me and the research I I, um, I work on, and. Um, I just, you know, maybe as fodder for questions as well, I think it is worth connected to the good systems project I briefly mentioned at the beginning. It's also always worth in AI taking a step back and thinking about, you know, if we achieve this goal of robust, fully autonomous agents in the real world as an example of, of, um, of an intelligent being, an intelligent artifact that we create, what would happen what would happen if we achieved that goal? Would it be a utopian society, um, like you know, envisioned by Rosie the robot in the in the Jetsons, or would it be a more dystopian society that many people have imagined in, in science fiction as well? And one of the ways I like getting at that question, which I invite you to to ponder, is you know, um, is the 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 progress in technology that AI, AI is a part of making the world a better place or a worse place? Or you know, more specifically, if you could choose between being having been born fifty years earlier or fifty years later, 
um, than you were, which would you choose? And it's not, that's not an easy question. There's a lot of different answers. I've had many people give compelling arguments either way, but I'm doing what I do because I, you know, I think um, AI and the kinds of things we're working on can be part of the solution, can help make the world a better place as we get more and more, you know, deeply into this uh, understanding the nature of intelligence. So with that, I'll stop my, my screen share and I'll be happy to take questions. Oh my gosh, Peter, you're blowing my mind over here. Um, so we do have a, a couple questions. Let me just pull the screen over. Joaquin asks, what is the basic level in terms of its coding of a robot? How difficult it is it to make an AI program? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's there's a lot of different ways to, to try to program robots. And in fact, when I started programming robots, um, you had to be a graduate student at one of the you know very few top uh, computer science departments in the world to have access to a robot. Um, over time, now it's gotten to the point where uh, you know first undergrads had access to robots, then high school students you know um, uh, had access, and now even you know elementary school students do have access to robots and can start. There's there's sort of fairly simple programming languages to the point where a colleague of mine told a story where his kindergarten daughter. Um, came home after, and you know, he got a newsletter from his teacher that said you know, they'd been working with robots. So he asked his daughter, oh, I heard you were learning to, to build robots today. And then she looked at her father and said, no, dad, we were just learning how to program the robots. Um, and you know, that's the, um, you know, that's, it's at the level where there are programming languages that you can write like simple if then rules that says, you know, if the robot sees you know, something orange, then turn right. You could program a, you know, a, a very simple program like that. On the other hand, if you want to program a robot to be very robust, to be able to deal with lots of different circumstances that it, you, you, know, you didn't envision or the robot that wasn't you know, um, prepared for, then the, the, the programming methodologies, the programming tools become more and more complicated. And, um, and so you know, there's, there's machine learning algorithms that, that, uh, that are useful. And so really it's very open-ended. You can, you can you know, Pro, get a robot and program it using, using very simple languages and you know to do sort of basic tasks but the kinds of things we're working on you know involve programs with you know thousands and sometimes you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines of code and experimental you know, algorithms that, that get you know that are really what you work on when you're a graduate student um, trying to get a PhD in computer science it's really interesting too I mean during COVID I'm sure that has changed your thinking about some of this stuff and what's possible. But Karen has a question and she asks, how does a robot's ability to perform a mechanical task relate to intelligence versus simply mechanical coordination? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, great, uh, you know, um, a great question as well. In fact, you know, this is something that's been, been studied um, for many, uh, or, or been sort of a, a paradox of, of robotics. Um, that actually I was on a meeting earlier today where somebody mentioned this, that even in the 1960s, somebody observed that it's a lot easier or has been a lot easier to get a robot to play a really good game of chess in software than to get the robot to actually pick up a piece and move it, right? And you know, for people, it's completely the opposite, right? You can teach, you know, a kid can just move the pawn, that's fine. The hard part is figuring out where should you move the pawn? Where should you move the queen? Whereas, you know, we had, chess programs that could beat the Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion in 1998, but no robot that could actually move the pieces physically around. And um, you know, now we, we have robots that can do that. Manipulation has gotten better. But really, you know, a lot of the, intelli the things that we think of as intelligent, as humans, um, aren't really the, the, what our brains spend most of their, you know, their, their processes working on, right? I mean, the ability of a bird to fly through a, you know, a, a bank, a forest of trees without running into any of the trees, that requires intelligence. It's, we don't think of it as, as sort of um, the kind of intelligence that you would go to school to learn, but you have to be an intelligent being, you know, to be able to do that. And so there's, I think motion and movement and manipulation, those are intelligence. They're just not, the, you know, they're not chess playing kind of intelligence, but they are, they are, it's, it's a different type of intelligence. And it's, you know, our, it's not often, it's not always the case that the things that we think of as hardest for people, that those are the hardest for robots, you know, and, um, and so that's, that's something, and, and anybody who's, you know, um, 
any AI researcher who's also a parent has always, you know, been, has, has exper experienced this sort of, you know, amazement as, you know, your kids grow up and, you know, in their first year or two of life, do things that we've spent years and years trying to get program our robots to do. And they do it, you know, without, seemingly without any effort. And, um, and you know, so that's, that's one of our all constant sources of inspiration is getting robots to be able to do things as well as people. And as I said in my talk, as, as a way of understanding the nature of intelligence and, um, and you know, we're still, we're still not there. There's still a lot to be understood. That's why it's such an exciting question to be studying. Yeah. Matthew asks, what advice do you have for students who want to get involved in robotics or do robotics research? That's also a great question. And, um, you know, the, the, the temp that you're, you're, you might assume since it is a science, it is, um, you know, it's something that it does require sort of, um, you know, uh, STEM kind of thinking, mathematics, and, and um, that, that, uh, that, you know, that, that would be the stock answer. But actually, if you want to get into uh, research and in artificial intelligence, um, I, uh, I think it's important to, to, do, uh, to do really well in, in sort of all areas of, um, of school. And in fact, to be a successful graduate student, often the skills that you need are more um, in English and in writing and communication, because part of, part of research isn't just discovering new things. It's also communicating what you've discovered and making sure people can, can build on that. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, for somebody to, to get into this area and to be very successful, it's important to do well in your, you know, your English classes, your writing classes, um, reading comprehension, and then also your, you know, um, your math and science classes. It really requires sort of being well-rounded and, and excelling in all areas of, of, um, of your education. And then you can, you know, you can go to a, um, to, you know, to college after high school and, and get an undergraduate degree in something related to computer science. It could be math, it could be, um, could be physics. And then, you know, to get to the real cutting edge, you typically go and do a PhD, enter a, enter a graduate program, um, you know, after four years of college and, and then, you know, try to get, get involved in the kinds of, kinds of research project that I described in my talk. So this will be the last question. Um, Patrick asks, can you talk about some of the real world applications for the robots you showed? Yeah, so there's, um, there's many possible ones. So, um, I mean, you know, robot soccer, those robots, you know, in some sense is just, you know, you, that, that's uh, at, for a challenge in the same sense as, you know, trying to get a um, land a, a person on the moon is a challenge, but to be able to land a person on the moon, um, the scientific community had to make a whole bunch of scientific breakthroughs um, that that were much much more broadly uh, applicable. Things like um, you know uh, remote telemetry and body monitoring and and um, astrophysics kinds of things. The same is going to go for for if we can you know achieve the goal in in robot soccer is there's you know the the ability to be able to um, to perceive things in the world to be able to take actions. Um, these things, you know, if if we can do them uh, successfully, the um, you know, th there's there's just really way too many applications to to um, to even mention. But but some of the ones that come to mind, I mean, I you know showed in mind autonomous driving. That is an applica application that requires these kinds of um, these kinds of reasoning. So having you know cars that are autonomous. But I I really you know I like to focus a lot on the, this notion of having a general purpose service robot, one that could be like Rosie the robot that could be in your home like in an appliance um, that you know not just doesn't just vacuum but could also unload your dishwasher and fold your laundry and and talk you know interact with people take requests can you find me my keys can you you know can you clean up the room um, you know that's that's a, a very you know to me inspiring application and then industry you know industrial labs are using robots now for all kinds of things that are getting more and more unconstrained like um being able to move you know uh, pack um boxes when you order something from amazon uh, it used to take a lot you know a lot of people walking around a big warehouse putting things in boxes if we can get robots to be able to move and manipulate and understand and plan then that can become automated, and that that's a that's a very topical current application. And so, you know, there, there's many, there's many more people are working on. Um, but uh, you know, I think it's there, there, the um, there's just endless possibilities. And again, that's why this is an exciting area. Incredible! Thank you so much, Peter. 
We really appreciate it. And we have a next guest who will join us, and she is Kristen Grumman. She is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and was elected to the Academy of Distinguished Teachers at UT Austin in 2017. And Kristen, welcome. I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, thanks, Peter, also for the great talk starting us off. And thanks to everyone for being here to um, chat with us about this research. So I am going to be picking up from where Peter was because today I wanna to tell you about some of our very recent work looking at how to watch people to build robots, agents that can learn directly from how humans do things. Okay, and I'm um, a faculty member in computer science and my specialty is computer vision. So the watching is central for me because I'm interested in having machines that can understand the world by seeing it. Now, if you um, think about computer vision, 10, 15 plus years ago, the cutting edge challenges were really about recognizing objects, being able to name them, find them. Those are still important problems, but what's really exciting is even in the time since I've been faculty at UT, the field has had some great successes that has led us past being able to try and name things and find things towards instead um, integrating perception with action. And this fits really well with our theme today because what this means is having perception where you can see here, maybe even touch in a way that's very much driven by the actions that an agent is trying to take. And this could permeate any kind of application like some of the ones we were just hearing about um, in robotics, autonomous vehicles, but also augmented reality. And this is driving a lot of my current research. And so the part I wanted to focus on in this short talk today is this question of how to have an agent learn. Now, Peter touched on how, you know, maybe earlier, more simpler methods would really pre-program the behavior of a robot so that it could do certain scripted things. Now, these days there's much more, right? And agents can learn. And how do they learn? Well, they can do this from direct experience. Think about the agent that maybe is holding an object and starts to figure out what happens to it if it moves a different way, purely through kind of brute force trial. That's valid. There's also the possibility of demonstrating, and that happens today where a person might do, as you see in that left photo, and kind of drag an end effector around to teach the robot how to do something very specific. Um, and these are all exciting and definitely worth tons of exploration still, but they are costly, right? Doing that kind of real world exhaustive experience, trial and error, or dragging a robot's arm around to show it how things work, this is costly. It's also a narrow way to do teaching. So here's the premise for what we're after is to ask this question, can we have agents learn by watching people and even seeing the world how people see it. So I'm showing you a video that's captured from a head mounted camera. So we call this an egocentric camera and this is a person going about shopping. And right away you can see that this video itself is revealing things like how people move in a space. How do they navigate a 3D environment? Where do they direct attention as a function of the task at hand? How do they interact with other people or even touch and use and manipulate other objects? So all these are things, of course, we'd love robots to understand better. And so this work that I'm going to try and highlight today very briefly is about making that step, right? Doing some people watching through video so that we can inform um, robot learning. And this extends from manipulating and navigating object, uh, robots to also augmented reality systems, which are human worn, like they see in the bottom left. So we wanna learn by watching how people interact. And today I'm gonna to highlight just two examples where we're doing this, one with objects. So how do people interact with objects such that robots could learn to do the same? And how do people interact with the environment? So if you remember what I said at, at the onset here, you know, vision used to be you know, hard enough just being able to name that this is a lamp, um, but we're, we're past that now, thanks to a lot of great progress in the field. So now let's go beyond naming objects to understanding how to use them. And this also has a visual foundation and that's what I wanna exploit. So if you wanted to learn so-called affordances before, um, even in recent literature, you would try to kind of handhold, teach the agent, say, give it photos of things and show it, okay, this is where you can hold the book. This is where you could adjust a lamp. And actually, you know, we can build systems that would learn to reproduce these kind of labels on new images so that it might see a new lamp and have a guess of where to adjust it or a book and where to hold it. But this is actually, you know, still in that vein of rather expensive and hand-holding teaching. 
What I'd like to see happen instead is that agents watch us use books or lamps or anything else and pick up on these so-called affordances or these potentials for action and where an object can be used. Okay, so imagine learn agents that could look at videos like these at any scale and now before even touching a book, have an expectation about how to use it. So this is exactly what we've been doing in some recent work. Uh, we took videos like you see here from YouTube product demonstrations or these egocentric head mounted camera videos on the right of people doing everyday cooking activities, learn how these objects get used and then translate what's learned to make predictions on new images and video about where the objects need to be touched, used, turned, toggled, et cetera, to, to make them function. Okay, so people watching from the video and now translating that to new data. So here's just an example output where we have a system that's looking through this video, it's an egocentric video, and predicting where things might be mixable that's shown in green. And you'll notice that this prediction was made in that case before the mixing actually happened, right? It was this potential of where things could be done. This is exactly what we need an agent to understand. Here are some other affordances. The agent thinks that wa that knife looks washable, um, including that one sitting to the side that you know has still not been washed. And it's seeing the world through the potential for action. Those jars look openable. This door over here, before it's opened, already the system could expect is a place where a hand might go in order to do an opening action. And of course, this is trivial to us human um, visual world understanders, but if you think about a robot that's just trying to parse the world in terms of what actions can be done where, this is um, going to be a, a very important tool, a different way to see the world, not as things that are nameable, but things that are usable in certain ways. Okay. Um, so of course we've quantified how well an agent can do this. So we'll look at images of objects and then ask to predict, you know, where can I press it? Where can I turn it, et cetera. And what was exciting about this work is just as I was motivating, you know, it's expensive to teach this with labels. It's expensive to teach it with direct demonstration. It's much more lightly supervised to do this through video. And in fact, we're still doing it with um, good accuracy increases at the same time. Now that leads to a next result on this line of work that I think is super cool, but also very preliminary. So here we were looking at how understanding of how objects work would actually help us know how to name them, right? So I said, understanding the visual world is not just about recognizing things. However, for people, our ability to do recognition is actually improved when we understand how things work. This is known. The question is, you know, does, does this hold for machines? So what I'm showing you here is a spectrum of refrigerators. Um, you'll have to take my word that on the left, these would be easy images to recognize. On the right, they're quite hard. In fact, today's state of the art recognition systems and computer vision would fail, right? And why? Well, actually these are all refrigerators, but they're breaking the canonical mold, mold as we move to the right. You know, the viewpoint's unusual, even the type of fridge might be unusual. But what we're finding is that if we encode these visual inputs, not just by their pixels and their deep convolutional neural network features, but also in terms of these predicted affordances, like where can I hold it? Where can I open it? This actually improves the system's ability to recognize these unusual cases, even with very low amounts of training data, the so-called low shot case. And so this is, again, a preliminary result, but suggesting that if agents know how the world works and even how humans use the world, this will prepare them to better even um, know how to recognize elements within it. Okay, so now I said that we wanna do people watching for agent learning. So let's start to make that bridge. Because um, I've just shown you, you know, that the agent's starting to see the world through how, how humans do, but now can it affect action? And one way we're looking at this lately is through a task um, in dexterous grasping. So dexterous, because this is a robot manipulator with five fingers, 30 degrees of freedom, um, very complex motions needed to do anything. Uh, and it's, for that reason, very hard to train or to learn in standard ways. However, our idea is that if we have agents that are looking at human the human world and human objects that are made for human hands, then watching people, how they use objects and understanding things like affordances would a, be a kickstart, right? For learning how to start touching them or using them. So the essence of this, that what we've done is to say, rather than you know bat the object around until you happen to be able to lift it up, which is something you might 
try to do in a normal learning framework today, we're going to have the system be preferring to touch these objects in ways like humans have in the video. Okay, so prefer doing this grasping in a certain way with the expectation this should speed up learning. It might even lead to better grasping of, and definitely could help us generalize to new objects. So here I'm just going to show you a small teaser video of doing just that, where the bottom right is our agent. Now it's not been given any demonstrations. No robot arm has been driven around to do this. What it has is purely its experience, trying things out in the world, plus these visual affordances about objects like I was showing you before. Um, and that's our method. Now the other three are kind of competing methods, what you might try to do. In the top ones, you wouldn't have this human prior. In the bottom left, you'd have a super expensive version of that human prior that required a lot more um, effort. And um, as you can see from some of these examples, you know, this is actually good progress relative to what we could do before, now that we're able to understand objects and how humans use them through the video content. Okay, and that shaking around is because we're trying to stress test the grass. You know, if you start knocking it around with some force, is it going to drop, drop the object? Now, the speed of learning did come out. So we did learn good policies for how to pick up new objects, even ones the agent hasn't seen before. And this is showing you a curve saying, well, how good is the model as a function of time it spent learning? And so you want this to be a sharp high curve. Our model's in blue, and the methods that don't know about how humans do things are the curves below. So something like 3x kind of speed up to get the same amount of um, accuracy in the learned model. Okay, so I have just a, another minute or so, and um, the last part I'll show you about two things. So I was talking about how people use objects um, in an object-centric way, but there's also, of course, the important factor of how people use their bodies themselves. And one really fun project we did lately in this regard was to take egocentric video, meaning a video captured, in this case, from a chest-mounted camera, looking out at the world, and infer from that what is the underlying body pose of the person behind the camera. And it's kind of cute, right? Because you're actually not seeing the body all that often. The person there, you know, there's a hand or something, but most of the time the body's out of view, but there is a visual regularity in the body's motion that you can detect from such a video and now start to make inference like we're showing on the right about what they're actually doing. You can see how this would be a tool towards augmented reality understanding of the person wearing this camera, but also to start to teach these robots. Okay, um, and the last bit I'm gonna skip to here, um, I talked about the environment. Now, very much in line with what I've been showing you, we wanna understand visual um, world, not in terms of what it is, or even you know the geometry of exactly what it is, which is important, but not enough. We also need to understand it in terms of its function. So here, jump up a level from where do I grasp an object to a house and where do I go to do any number of different tasks or how do, where might I sit versus where I would exit the building. And so we've been building video models that allow us to take egocentric human worn cameras to experience the world through their eyes and say in a kitchen environment, learn where different activities tend to take place and in what sequence. So we've built video encoders that will build these topological graphs over a space, understanding how a person organizes that space by their own activities, which is very different than organizing it strictly through geometric measurements of where everything is. Okay, so we're kind of bringing these things together. So now we can predict where things are possible. And my final slide here, we're then having agents that can look at the world in this way, saying, this is where I probably could do X, Y, or Z. And so they're gonna learn new behaviors faster, even when they enter a new environment. And the analogy I like to give is, you know, imagine how good you are about going to a friend's kitchen and their new apartment and still feeling at ease enough to function, right, and do things. We're gonna get agents that can do the same, but it requires this ability to translate um, the, the functionality of new spaces from one space to another, okay? So I'll stop here. Thanks so much for your attention and being here and be glad to take any questions. Thanks so much, Kristen. That was amazing. Um, Alex asks, and this is such an interesting question, since humans are the ones teaching robots, can we create robots that don't have the inherent human biases of our creators, of their creators, I guess? Right. Yeah. And it's a great question as to which do we prefer. And I think it you know, certainly would depend on the application context. Are we better off with robots that are limited in the ways we are limited or 
is this a domain where we want robots to do things better, faster, or different than us? And I think both certainly matter. Um, you know, my theme today was about wanting to get that leg up because we under, you know, we could have systems that understand how people do things because the gap is so far, kind of as Peter alluded to, you know, think of the chess pieces or, um, or the bird flying, et cetera. So, um, so there's a gap there, but I think it's not that, you know, we shouldn't say that it's, we wouldn't want um, robots that do certain things more um, intelligently than us. So like to give an example, you know, maybe human-like behavior is just right on when you're talking about a service robot that behaves in social settings and, you know, shouldn't run through 60 miles per hour down the hallway to do some task. Whereas, you know, a robot maybe in a factory whose efficiency is the optimal, the efficiency being optimal is the thing, you know, that's perfectly what you need. Don't be human-like. Um, so yeah, I think you might trade off and get different value out of that depending on the context. Interesting. Um, Zachary asks, do robots always need to be trained before they can be put to use? Or are there situations where they can just learn in real time? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so that brings up a great challenge of being able to learn while doing a task. So you might have different layers here, right? You could have the robot that's maybe in a factory and it's very much pre-programmed and behavior is not going to deviate from that course. And at the other extreme is, I think, what the question suggests too, where even if it's learned something or has some model, it's willing to evolve and adapt in real time. Um, you know, one, one sub part of machine learning people try to do to tackle to consider this is like lifelong learning. You know, we humans are, are definitely lifelong learners, we can be. Um, and today's agents, not so much, but it's a great research challenge to say, I've learned what I've learned, but uh, it's able to adapt and even change my models uh, in time as I get new experience. And it's very non-trivial because even knowing when the current models are breaking is itself you know, a challenge for an intelligent agent. So Brian asks the next question and he says, your work seems to have great potential to make machines interact with human, the human world better, but is there potential to augment human performance too, i.e. make me better at specific tasks? Yeah, absolutely. And I think augmented reality is a great place to showcase this. So if you think of a augmented reality device of the future, maybe a wearable glasses that can see the world like you're seeing it and hear it, like you're hearing it, um, and ha have an always on intelligent assistant with you to improve your own behavior, yes. So why would this, how does this fit together? Well, I'll just to give a concrete example, suppose you're in the kitchen cooking a souffle for the first time and the, the agent your assistant in this augmented reality device is going to let you do all the heavy lifting to the point, though, where you're not sure what to do. And so you get real time advice about, oh, wait, hang on, you skipped a step, you need to do it here. Um, this is just one, you know, um, household kind of example of where when we have agents that understand what we're doing, they can also augment our intelligence. Just to give you a second example there, think of a superhuman hearing agent where because it's, you know, um, hearing everything I hear, seeing what I see. And suppose I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing the person across from me in a noisy restaurant. Well, an intelligent agent would give to me the right um, audio input such that it's not cluttered with everything else going on, but really focused on the person I wanna hear. That's another kind of superhuman power that allows us to excel or augment our own perception um, with methods that we're trying to develop. Yeah. So this will, this will be the last question. And Lillian asks, I'm interested to learn more about the terminology for robots. Is there a reason you refer to them as agents and others refer to them as robots? Uh, yeah, so I've been using the term agent to be a little bit more general than robot in the sense that the robot would certainly have a physical body, um, maybe mobile, or at least may have some manipulating end effectors. Um, whereas agent I use um, to represent the fact that it's an intelligent being that has agency and the ability to make decisions or control its own environment in certain ways. And so that allows, I think, to talk a little bit more generally about both robotics and say augmented reality or autonomous navigation kind of with one general term. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much, Kristen. This was incredible. I really appreciated it. And hopefully I'm gonna talk about our next Views and Brews, but hopefully you and Peter will join us on a Views and Brews sometimes this year because in person, perhaps, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I have just a couple more announcements. Thank you to all of you who are watching. It's been great to have you along and your fantastic 
questions. Um, obviously, we need to bring this to a close right now. So thank you, Peter, and thank you, Kristen, for your time and your knowledge and your perspectives, your expertise. And as we wrap, this is one of the last days of the Texas Science Festival, sadly. So keep an eye on your inbox and you'll be receiving an invitation to provide your feedback on your experiences so that the organizers can learn what you liked and what you'd like to change or improve for next time. Also, KUT's Views and Brews is a series that I produce and host, and it is virtual next month and features more science. We'll be talking about wildfires on April 20th at six o'clock. So I hope to see you online and hopefully in person very, very soon. Thank you to all of us for joining, all of us for joining. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for joining today and please enjoy the texas science festival videos and um check back again next time and take care everybody be safe thank you <laughs>